You're watching Bread and Roses. Hi everyone, I'm Aram Namazi. And I'm Farid Urspuya. In this week's program, we're going to be talking about the horrendous terrorist attack in Tehran, which took the lives of 12 people. Uh, we have an interview with David Rand, president of Atheist Free Thinkers uh, from Canada. We'll also be talking about an insane fatwa, uh, where, you know, the fasting of those in Qatar is considered irrelevant because a Saudi sheikh said so. And our Slice of Life is an amazing international conference that will be celebrating apostasy and blasphemy in London. Don't go away, stay with us. Stay with us. Last week's terrorist attack in, on two places in Tehran, we know that 12 people have been killed, over 40 people have been wounded, and of course the first thing that has to come to mind is a condemnation of any terrorism anywhere and also a thought to all those innocent people who've been killed by yeah. Daesh which has taken responsibility for the yeah, act. And you see the scenes of the terrorists entering the administrative part of the uh, Islamic Majlis um, in Tehran randomly and indiscriminately shooting at people who were you know general public sitting in a waiting area and shooting people behind, you know, from behind. It just is, these are innocent people who have nothing, they have done nothing to deserve this. And that's the essence of terrorism. It targets uh, civilians and must be condemned without any if or but. There's a lot of other issues that needs to be unpicked. Mm. But the first thing we've got to do without any excuses, they need to be condemned. And we, people have the right to live without fear of being targeted it doesn't matter whether it's in London, in Tehran, in Syria, in Iraq, in Africa. And what in, we're yeah, seeing everywhere. is that people are taking sides in, in a way. And I think that hum, human aspect of it is being lost. So there are people who are siding with the Saudi regime. There are people who are siding with the Iranian regime uh, because of the political games they're playing. I think what, what is clear is that both of them are two poles of uh, international terrorism in the world today. You know, and that's at one side of the issue. I don't think we should be taking sides with either pole of terrorism or also U.S.-led terrorism, yeah, which is another aspect of it. We should yeah. be siding with people and saying that terrorism is, you know, not justifiable in any way, shape or form. And we know that the Islamic regime of Iran uh, has been funding, uh, is the biggest funder of terrorist, terrorism across the world. So is Saudi Arabia and Qatar. Now they have, have infight, this infighting between Qatar and, and Saudi Arabia. All of them are funders of terrorism. That's the only way that they can advance the interest by unleashing indiscriminate terror on the civilians. And uh, what the world has to say, this needs to stop. They have no, people have the right to live free of daily attack by these are states, effectively these are arms of the states operating in the, you know, in different parts of the world. And when people try to justify this or excuse this, that's at the higher echelon of government. At the I mean, higher echelon of government, we'll see that the representative uh, of the United States who uh, is, um, you know, in, in the uh, session in the Congress uh, is talking about, is that better for people to uh, kill each other? For the U.S. to let ISIS kill as as the Islamic, uh, you know, people in Iran and vice versa because they're enemies of the United States, which is really a despicable way of looking at it. And in a sense, it's, it rings uh, the same as uh, Socialist Workers Party, for example, saying, well, you know, after 9-11 in the U.S., it's chickens coming home to roost. So this constant justification and legitimization of acts of terror, depending on where you stand. And I think one of the things that the terrorists do is that they dehumanize those they attack, which is why they're able to kill people indiscriminately without any feeling of remorse. If those who are supposedly opposed to terrorism have that same view depending on who's killed well it's really that same sort of really method and approach yeah. uh, approach yeah. dehumanized yeah. view of the enemy of the other yes so we want to really condemn uh, terrorist activity in tehran we know that the islamic regime of iran is going to uh, use this as an opportunity 
to uh, strengthen his hand. Um, they already started to talk about, oh, there were Kurds among those uh, um, supporters of Daesh and start to sort of uh, undertake military activity mm. in the Kurdish region and uh, use it yeah. against the opposition. And that's what they do. They always use this opportunity to strengthen the most right-wing element of each government. And we've seen that in, in Syria, we've seen that in Iraq, and we'll see it anywhere that the terrorism sort of interferes and the method of terrorist activity and which atta attacks these civilians. Um, yeah, and finally, the, the issue is that, look, people are saying pray for Tehran. I don't think we should pray for Tehran. I mean, the reality is that religion and the religious right is why we're in the situation we are today. We should have human solidarity across borders for people, no matter where these attacks take place, and stand up to the terrorists, which are not just Daesh, but they're also in the Islamic regime of Iran. They're also in the Saudi government. These are states that work together and have made uh, even though they might be rivals at some points, they've made life hell for people across the globe. So we need to stand with yeah. people against terrorism. And the U.S. is not free yes. from this. Its yeah. militarism has created, as we were talking yeah. earlier, yeah. a space it, for this. It is not it? an excuse, but we need to recognize that uh, United States foreign policy mm -hmm. has been based on unleashing terror as a means of advancing its uh, um, interests in Middle East and North, uh, North Africa, particularly in the Middle East. And they have to take responsibility for this. It's not a justification for terror, but it's a, 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 some sort of explanation. And we need to consider that, you know, United States has been party to creating an environment for the right wing to Thrive and, in, it, and it still supports a lot of Islamist groups uh, in, in its uh, promotion of its foreign policy. Islamism came to center stage because of its foreign policy uh, demands during the Cold War. So, you know, to say that terrorists kill innocent people because they're upset about U.S. foreign policy is not acceptable. Uh, because as we, we, we know, terrorists kill people all over the world and more so in the Middle East and North Africa. But to say that the U.S. has had a role in the situation and is also responsible for the situation is is, is a fact, really, and yeah. something that we need to Too recognize. Much. Yeah. So solidarity with people everywhere and, and standing up to all forms of terrorism, uh, no matter what. And I think the best way to do that is to stop dehumanization of those who are considered the enemy, the other, you know, and to, to see... Um, our links, our lives linked with each other against this bleak uh, mark on our, on our world today. David, it's a pleasure to have you on our program. It's a pleasure to be here. I wanted to speak to you first, I guess, on this motion of, for Islamophobia, condemning Islamophobia. I think a lot of people were shocked about it. Tell us a bit more about this motion and what it represents. Uh, well, the good news is that it doesn't have force of law. It does not directly threaten free speech now, not yet. That's the good news. The bad news is that it's a uh, major step forward towards um, uh, criminalizing event, not criminalizing is perhaps too strong a word, but repressing free speech against Islam. It, it doesn't repress it now, but it's a step in that direction. And uh, so criticism of Islam is going to get more and more difficult. Also, this is not the first such motion uh, there were two previous to it, one in the Quebec National Assembly in 2015, I believe, and it was unanimous, uh, and another in the Canadian Parliament last year, and then this one, uh, which passed, I believe it was only a week ago approximately, in late March, we're now April 2nd, um, and uh, it's basically a victory for radical political Islam because it sends a message that if you criticize Islam somebody might accuse you of Islamophobia 
and Islamophobia has been condemned by the Canadian Parliament and there may be negative repercussions, maybe not immediately. If they've done this now, then what's to prevent them from passing something stronger with more effect in the future? It's basically a step towards a new blasphemy law. Canada already has a blasphemy law, which we're trying to get rid of. It's uh, Article 296, I believe, in the Criminal Code. It hasn't been used in decades. Uh, but if a new one is passed as a, as a future, you know, outgrowth of this motion on Islamophobia, it could very well be worse than the existing blasphemy law because it talks about Islam in particular, therefore it gives a privilege to a particular religion which could cause interreligious conflict. And also we can be sure that there'll be uh, lots of fanatical Islamists who are, who are who make sure it's enforced, whereas the current blasphemy law is, 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 hasn't been enforced in ages. So uh, it's very troubling. What do you say to people who say, well, this is a way of stopping terrorism, especially with the awful, you know, tragic attack on a mosque recently? Well, it has nothing to do with that attack on the mosque other than the fact that people are using mass murder, uh, they're exploiting that mass murder as an excuse to pass this motion. That, uh, what happened in uh, Quebec City was an attack on people, on Muslims. Uh, to Islamophobia, the word means fear of Islam. It's perfectly reasonable to be afraid of Islam, especially its political, radical, fundamentalist variant. I'm afraid of radical Christianity. I mean, there are radical Christians who murder abortion doctors or pass anti-gay legislation or, you know, the fundamentalists of all religions are, are dangerous. And uh, f furthermore, it, it's not going to uh, make things better, it's going to make things worse because everybody, you know, who thinks clearly can see that this is unfair. It's going to make it... Uh, difficult for people to, to, to express their fears of terrorism, uh, of fears of Islamist terrorism, and, and which is going to uh, make the uh, social climate even worse. You know, and we, I think it's, if, if it does anything, it'll increase the probability of some kind of, uh, 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 of acts of violence, acts of hatred, uh, could probably increase as a result of this unfair emotion. What about the Canadian blasphemy law? What's, when was the last time uh, it was used and what are the hopes of it being rid of, gotten rid of? Well, um, the last time was, uh, I, I'm not sure of the date, I think it was in the, it was ha over half a century ago, a long time ago. Um, and uh, there was a petition uh, started by a couple of organizations a petition to um, to abolish this uh, last me law our organization supported it uh, the, this move and the federal government under the new prime minister uh, Justin Trudeau gave some indication that it might remove it as it was cleaning up the criminal code in various ways the last I've heard of though is that uh, they've decided not to change it but I'm I haven't heard anything definite. You talk about multiculturalism as an ideology, and, and in a sense, all of that feeds into this Islamophobia motion and all of that. Oh, oh yes, it's all much, uh, very much uh, of a piece. Uh, multiculturalism, what it means literally, is just cultural diversity. That's what it used to mean in the good old days, but now it, it basically means. Uh, it means cultural relativism, it means that uh, the person's ethno-religious identity is more important than their citizenship, it means that people are labeled by their, by the community in which they're born and raised, so that Muslims get the Muslim label stuck on them, that's what multiculturalism means. And this, uh, this empowers fundamentalists of every religion, if, if if religious identity becomes so important, then that empowers those who are most pious, most fundamentalist. Uh, and so, uh, multicultural, multiculturalism plays very much into the hands of the Islamists.
it makes it harder for for Muslim dissenters to express themselves and to uh, to escape that identity. It makes it harder to to uh, change religion, for example, or to become an atheist if a if a Muslim wants to, to leave Islam. I mean, it's already difficult enough, especially in Islam, where where apostasy is uh, is considered to be a horrible sin and in many countries a crime. Now. I mean, it's not a crime in Canada, but uh, you know, if, if if the label is stuck on people, it's harder for them to get rid of it. And Canada has a multiculturalism act, so I, I call it an ideology because it's 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 in law, it's a mentality uh, which uh, essentializes religion, and religion is not essential. Religion is or should be a choice. You can change religion. You can't change your race. Uh, you can't. Uh, you can't change your sexual orientation very easily. Uh, you know, you can't change your age except to grow older. Uh, so, but you can change your religion. So, religion is not an essential trait, and so it shouldn't be essentialized by by identifying people by that label all the time. So, you know, you talk about the sort of persecution of atheists. Uh, yes. You spoke about it at the uh, conference in Poland. Uh, do you think this sort of multiculturalism and Islamophobia feed into a situation where it's easier to persecute atheists? Well, indirectly, yes. It, it doesn't have a... Well, I would say the effect would be direct within religious communities. It makes it harder for Muslims in particular to come out as atheists. That, that, that's true. For those of us who are not part of the Muslim community, it doesn't affect us directly, but uh, there is an indirect effect where uh, religious identity becomes very important, and so not having a religion is seen as something not normal. It, it, it increases uh, atheophobia indirectly, at least. And uh, I mean, al already uh, there's a mentality that everybody's got a religion, and uh, if you don't have one, then you know you should get one. There's a there's a uh, there's a course in the Quebec school system called Ethics and Religious Culture, and it's r obligatory. And the Quebec school system is supposed to be secular, but this this obligatory course is there, and it well, just the title right off the bat is bad because it associates ethics with religion, as if you can't be an ethical person without religion. But it basically teaches that. You know, all children have a religious identity. And what is yours? And if you don't have one, there's something wrong with you. That's the mentality that's taught. And this is the mentality of multiculturalism, that, uh, that you identify people not as citizens of, of a country with, you know, what we have in common is our citizenship and our belonging to this country and making democratic decisions. No, you're a Muslim and you're a Christian and uh, you're a Jew and you're something else. Uh, and you're a, you know, an... Uh, member of a particular native uh, religion from uh, First Nations people, or and, and by identifying people with their religion, uh, it's uh, it divides and uh, it it weakens the social fabric. It divides people, and uh, it's uh, those who promote multiculturalism claim it claim that it's a solution for racism, but it's not. It's more like a form of uh, light racism itself. Just as a final question, you know, the idea that morality comes from religion, you talked about that at the conference as well. Oh, uh, yes, we, we certainly have to, as atheists and secularists, we have to fight this idea that somehow you need to have a religion to be a moral person. Because, uh, I mean, morality can't come from God because, well, so, for so many reasons, but the, I mean, Plato wrote it down, attributing it to Socrates, uh, 2,500 years ago. Where, you know, if if um, if you do something because God said it, would it be good even if God hadn't commanded it? Or you know, is is something good only because God commands it? In that case, uh, for example, if uh, anyway, Jehovah commands Abraham to kill his son, that means killing your son is moral. Uh, this is where theistic morality goes to. That's where it leads. So that's kind of an absurd situation. So uh, we make decisions about morality independent of what the sacred scriptures say. 
and, and, and as a matter of fact, we judge the scriptures and we say, oh, well, that, you know, killing the Canaanites in the Bible is not a good thing. We, we, morality exists independent of, uh, independent of religious beliefs. And so atheists uh, can be just as moral, in fact, more moral, uh, because, uh, because the theistic morality is a corruption of morality. Uh, and, uh, for example, there are some people who say, you can be good without God. This is not the way to say it. You should say, if you're a religious believer, you can be good in spite of that, but it would be easier if you'd stop believing in that nonsense. It would be easier for you to be a good person. You, in other words, you can be good with God, but it's better not to have one. Okay. Thank you very much. Now the Saudi Sheikh al-Mufti al-Ulama, he has issued a fatwa, and it's a very important fatwa, especially if you live in Qatar, you should be warned. He says that because the Saudi government is angry with Qatar, that anyone who fasts in Qatar, their fast is irrelevant. And unacceptable to God, God would unacceptable. not accept unless you go and apologize to the Saudi government. Yes. This is just like end of the line for fatwas. <laughs> And we know it ends, it ends in the palaces of the Saudi uh, and, and religious sort of, you know, whatever they are, <laughs> at the end of it. And you've got to apologize because so, these are diplomatic... If of, you live in Qatar, yes. you know what to do. If you don't want your fast. fast, that's actually the best option, you know, don't yeah. fast. But if you have to fast, go and apologize first, otherwise it's not going to work. Yes. It's just... This is shows how now you know empty religious fat and stupid, 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 stupid. July twenty second to twenty fourth is going to be an immense celebration of apostasy and blasphemy in London. There's an international conference that is going to defend the freedom of conscience, freedom of expression, but particularly the freedom to reject religion, to renounce religion, and even to criticize it. That's a right that we find, you know, uh, under attack really, and particularly from those who are coming from the so-called Islamic world. You and know? These, are, these are the people who are actually frontline of defending okay. Defending freedom of expression, freedom of thought, and freedom to uh, have the right to change societies for the better. And you must come and hear every single one of them who have something important to say. Yeah, I think each and every one of the speakers are, you know, really people in and of themselves who could have conferences on their own. They're going to be from all over the world, uh, particularly the Middle East, South Asia, and North Africa. And this is I think going to be the largest gathering of free thinkers, especially from uh, countries under Islamic rule. And it's being labeled the Glastonbury of free thinkers. We're going to show you a short clip after this with the speakers and uh, some of the, the wonderful things that they've done and that they've stood up for. Yes, come and join us on in July 22nd to 24th. Just to also mention that on the 24th, there's going to be body painting uh, as well in defense of ex-Muslims across the globe. Yes, yeah, Victoria Guggenheim is going to be doing that. Excellent. And on the first day of the conference, we're going to have an event, an art uh, protest in defense of free thinkers from Raif Badawi to Sina Dehkan, to Bangladeshi bloggers, to um, Ayaz uh, Nizomi in Pakistan, defending free thinkers across the globe. So it's, it's really an event people shouldn't miss if yes. they can make it. So we encourage you to join us. That brings us to the end of the program for this week. We hope that you've enjoyed this week's program. Until next week, from me and Maria. Goodbye. Bye.
Hi, I'm Mariam Namazi. And I'm Fadi Bospuya. We're hosting a program called Bread and Roses. It's a weekly program that's broadcast in Persian and English in the Middle East and North Africa, primarily Iran as well. And it's also shown on YouTube internationally. And we've been doing this since last May. We're coming up to a year's anniversary and yeah. we, we've had quite a lot of fun making these videos. We discuss taboo breaking, free thinking ideas. The Islamic regime of Iran has called us immoral and corrupt. And that's why the, you need to support us. We are and the alternative voice in Middle East and North Africa. Of corruption and immorality. So do support us. Here's a short video from Patreon that explains how you can help us with even just one dollar a week. That's nothing. Support us. Patreon lets fans become patrons of their favorite artists and content creators. It's different than Kickstarter because it's not about one big project that requires lots of funding. It's more for bloggers or YouTubers or web comics, anyone who creates on a regular basis. Here's how it works. When you become a patron, you're agreeing to give an artist a tip of an amount you set every time they release a piece of content, whether it's a new song, a video, or a recipe. You can set a monthly maximum to make sure that you're always within your budget. Choose an amount, enter your payment information, and you're done. Becoming a patron allows you to view and post in the artist's stream. And in exchange for your support, artists offer additional patron packages, which might include monthly Google Hangouts, music production tutorials, pre-sale concert tickets, or anything they can offer as a way to say thanks. Patreon, empowering a new generation of content creators.